New Apple products leaked in Tim Cook's latest interview. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the All Future Podcast. We're here all the time talking about all kinds of stuff from the future. Mm -hmm. So very exciting today because, look, we're going to talk about something I like to talk about a lot off the bat. How awesome Tim Cook is. <laughs> look, I'm just going to say it. Tim Cook is great. Dude's, mm -hmm. dude's smart. Mm -hmm. Dude is smart. So to lead off, he's uh, just did this interview. A lot of juicy stuff in here, man. A lot of juicy stuff in here. And this is what I would say. This is what I'd say. If you were into hearing a brilliant CEO talk about those things and then hearing two guys with moderate experience also talk about those things, please consider subscribing. Please consider subscribing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into it. Let's get into it. Uh, Tim Cook does this interview. It, look, the, all the headlines really... Apple intelligence, right? Like, obviously, he's going to be asked about that. Mm -hmm. This interview is probably set up specifically by the Apple marketing team to promote Apple intelligence yeah. stuff. But there are, I think, some... It's not all just fluff. I think he, he gives some good, interesting, factual things and his kind of point of view on things, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. Let's get into it. Yeah, so the first thing is just to summarize it. Tim mm -hmm. Cook says, Apple intelligence has changed his life. Which I'll read some of the quotes here as mm -hmm. to why he would say that. But it sounds like a, you know, okay, yeah, sure, it changed your life. Uh huh. This new, mm -hmm. of course it did. It's the latest <laughs> Apple feature. Of course it changed your life. But he said, quote, we're perfectly fine with not being first. As it turns out, it takes a while to get really great. It takes a lot of iteration. It takes worrying about every detail. Sometimes it takes a little longer to do that. So there, they're talking about, yes, we're late, but. We want to do it right. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on with a couple other quotes about what's best for the customer. But then he says, if I can save time here and there, it adds up to something significant across a day, a week, a month. It's changed my life. It really has. So there, when you really get these features integrated into your life and get things optimized, it can save you a lot of time. So that's what he's saying. It's, it's changed his life because he's saving all of this time with all of these features that are now available to him. And I guess this does confirm Tim Cook is a beta user. I'm sure he's on something <laughs> crazy, too. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. He's on 20.5. Well, it it yeah. looks like he got early access. Good for him. Yeah, yeah good yeah, for him. Yeah, he's like <laughs> using his iPhone 27. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like totally different. Um, uh, yeah, and this, I think, this hits on from, you know, what I was talking about when I was cheerleading Tim <laughs> at the top of the video here. This is why I think he was such a good pick to succeed Steve Jobs here. Mm -hmm. And this highlights that. Uh, what a monumental challenge to follow up arguably one of the most famous CEOs in history, Steve Jobs. Most famous founders in history. Mm -hmm. Like, who's on that list? Henry Ford, right? <laughs> like, like, you're, yeah. like you're, like, you're competing against, like, legendary people here and he comes in and it shows why he was such a better choice than say someone like johnny ive or forstall or all these other guys that were around all the other guys who were all about all the flashy stuff mm -hmm. right tim cook is a logistics guy right he's a practical guy and this this kind of quote here where he talks about hey like if we can make something a little bit better than what's out there that's a big deal for a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. that, that changes things over time. And we don't need to kill ourselves to try to be first or to try to, that, that stupid Silicon Valley adage of move fast and break things. It's like, that's dumb. That's dumb. Let's make a solid, solid product and let's keep making it a little better over time. That's what has made Apple more successful than it has ever been under Tim Cook. The ap Apple stock prices has hit all time highs in the last week or so, mm -hmm. right? They've sold more products than they ever have under anyone, um, mostly Steve Jobs, because the other CEOs didn't do so great. But uh, but it's still, and, and it, it reminds me of, there's this famous Steve Jobs story about the boot-up screen. Do you know the story? No. So he goes, he goes to the engineers, and this is, you know, I think Steve Jobs' real brilliance in a lot of ways was being able to talk to the engineers in putting them in the shoes of customers and the user side of the experience. And he talked about shaving time off the boot up screen. And they were like, hey, yeah, we're, we're pretty good. Like, and people don't even think about this anymore because we're using these mobile devices that don't even boot up. They just stick mm -hmm. on all the time. I'm sure a lot of people on this podcast remember powering up a computer and <laughs> waiting for the startup, right? And you I mean, it, 
I mean, you have a, like a some crazy old Windows machine. It's like a minute to get these things going or something. Sometimes longer, if yeah. not longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a lot of time. And this idea of like, hey, if we can figure out how to get ten seconds knocked off of that, like you think ten seconds, whatever, ten seconds, right? Ten seconds over time is huge, right? That's mm-hmm. a lifetime of time saved, right? And and what matters is is not that ten seconds, but what you're doing on the back end of that ten seconds, right? Like if if you are the guy, and we've all been there who have used computers in our lives, right? Something happens, something's broke. It's right before that big Zoom meeting or something, and you got to hit the restart for some reason. And now, thanks to all this technology and SSDs and all this, I'm 20 seconds out from being back in that meeting. Not that big a deal, but it used to be a lot longer. Like we're saying, and it's like those those things mattered. Those things really mattered. Mm-hmm. So you know, Cook here talking about things from that perspective. That hey, like if I can just make my life go a little easier in small ways, that's a big deal in the long run. And that's what's gonna make people love our products. And it's been a strategy that has absolutely worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating to hear about. And that is absolutely what Apple's approach is here. Saving you time. How can we save you time with utilizing all of this latest tech that is coming out, but actually package it into something that the average customer wants and uh, wants to utilize and can take advantage of. And Tim talks about his future vision also in this interview, saying, I love the emerging world. I love the idea for a bunch of people to feel like tomorrow is better than today. The dream, the belief that you're going to stand on your parents' shoulders. It's not that people are wrong and we're right. We have enough faith that if we love the product, there will be enough other people out there that love it too. So this kind of brings us to Apple Vision. Because we can, we hear a quote like that, and it's like, wow, yes, the yeah. iPad. Yes, yeah, they were yeah. right on the iPad. They yeah. were right on the Apple Watch. Sure. At this point in time, most people do not think they were right on the Apple Vision Pro <laughs> because it's about $3,500. It's not selling super well. There's actually a recent report saying that they're soon going to stop production of the Apple Vision Pro. Big headline. Apple ending production of the Apple Vision Pro. It's not quite as bad as it sounds. It's because they have enough stock already. They've made still plenty. Still kind of still bad. Still kind of bad, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, like, but uh, they've made enough, I think, for 2024 to satisfy what they expect to actually sell based on how it's been selling. So, yes, it's not selling as well as they had hoped, and they are having to cut back production. But it's not like, okay, the product's over. They're still moving forward with some sort of future version. But in any case on the Apple Vision specifically. And so Tim does specifically mention that price tag here. He says, at $3,500, it's not a mass market product. Right now, it's an early adopter product. People who want to have tomorrow's technology today, that's who it's for. And that is the take I've had, for sure. And so it's interesting to see it from Tim Cook, because Apple is always presenting things as this is what everyone wants. This is our next big thing. And even there, they presented that $3,500 gives you the cost of a full-size 4K monitor. It gives you the cost of a computer because this has an M2 chip in it. It gives you all of this stuff. But yeah, here they're acknowledging this is not a mass market product. Yeah, but I mean, uh, what do you want Tim to say here? He's not not, going to be like, we screwed this one up, right? (laughs) We don't know yet, right? Ask us in three, four years whether this is a smart move or not, Mm -hmm. right? And whether the technologies and the things they built into this led to something better, right? Yeah. And whether it was too early to try to unleash us on people. Stopping production on a thing is is not a good thing. Right? Yeah. Like that's just it's just not a good thing. Like there's no way to sugarcoat mm-hmm. that. I think they were at like a thousand units a day is what they were making. And now they're cutting that back to zero, I think. Which is still minuscule. Mm-hmm. Minuscule, right? Like a, you know, there's all kind of numbers out there on like what's the active user base right now for the a Vision Pro. And the, the low end numbers are like low six figure numbers, you know, like a hundred, two hundred thousand people every mm-hmm. day using this thing. Um, which I mean, for context, I, I haven't looked at the analytics on our channel, but I bet like our unique views are not that far off in a month, you know, from that. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> so it's like ugh, when a when a couple guys in a drumming studio are <laughs> getting more engagement than an <laughs> Apple product, uh, this isn't good. This isn't good. Mm-hmm. Um, but it. We'll see. Again, we don't know how this is all going to play out. Like, mm-hmm. maybe this is going to turn out to be, oh, like, the visual computing was the way to go. I think it, the writing's a little bit on the wall, though, That right? The, the answer is not Apple's version of it, which is still a, I'm sitting at a desk but have a thing on my face 
which is kind of what they're set up to do with the Vision Pro. Mm-hmm. Um, it is that the mobile AR glasses, right? Like that's that's the thing. That's what people are going to make, and that's what people are going to want. Yeah. The the Project Orion that Meta just unveiled, that sort of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's you talk about like the thousand units a day or whatever. Like evidently, Meta made like over a thousand of those things, right? And then those are just an internal product, not meant for sale. Mm-hmm. Sell, right? Uh, like I, I every time I use the Vision Pro, I'm like, this is cool. I used yours a couple of weeks ago to mm-hmm. we were watching some of the 3D content. That Super Bowl thing was phenomenal. I loved that. Mm-hmm. Like it was like like watching the Chiefs Super Bowl and like being in a locker room and yeah. I got to see how tall I am, you know, next to Mahomes. Very cool. Mm-hmm. I think I can take him. I think I can take him. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, this stuff is super cool. But it's just at thirty five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. it's not cool enough. Yeah, I should. If you have time after filming today, I should show you the submerged thing because that's out oh, now. Oh, cool! Yeah, it's the first scripted short film for the Apple Vision. Did and you? Did you? Were you into it? Did you watch it? Yeah, was it's, it cool. It was very cool in a lot of ways. And Andrew and I talked about some of the issues that it had. Like, yeah, camera movement. A lot of what you predicted mm-hmm. about it was true. That there's not much camera movement, and we feel like it almost could have done more mm-hmm. in that regard. And then there's certain things where the scale is actually really off because. It feels real life, and then it's a close up on someone, so their head feels like this big in front of you. Yeah, which is it's a lot different than just a close up shot that's because it's in three D and it's immersive, absolute, and you're looking yeah. around. That, that, and that's yeah, uh, this is a hard tech to sell. It's been a hard tech to sell. Mm-hmm. Like VR has been a hard tech to sell. It has been a technology that some people love, mm-hmm. and I think it's cool. But even me, like I don't own any VR thing, and I'm mm-hmm. like a guy with a bunch of tech toys, yeah. right? And I've never been like. Every time I've used someone, I was like, oh, this is neat. Mm-hmm. And even the, whatever, the $300 cheap uh, Quest, I've never bought one. And so, ugh, hard sell, Tim. Hard sell on this one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this all has to do with future technology. And he talks about this being tomorrow's technology today because mm-hmm. it's an early adopter expensive thing. But Apple's VP of Human Interface Design also kind of further talked about this and the innovation that comes from it and said it takes not only that big idea that might be innovative, but really the hundreds of thousands of innovative ideas that come after it. So that's whatever the Apple Vision shows us today, what it can bring us in the future, which we think it's AR glasses. We think it's that future product. But Apple's also thinking about a million things here. We, yeah. we don't know what the Apple Vision could be actually showing them for the future. Absolutely, right? And, you know, it, it, yeah, is, is the Apple Vision going to be the iPad, the Apple Watch, things that eventually got pretty wide-scale mm-hmm. adoption? Or will it be like that robotic car that they spent billions on and we never saw anything from yeah. that? And obviously there was a lot of problems with that and, and a lot of technological challenges that the, on the Tesla side, uh, they're like, oh, we can do it. We can do it. And they just had this robo taxi event. Mm-hmm. We occasionally talk Tesla on this channel, not mm-hmm. a lot, but for you guys that don't know, Ryan has probably one of the most popular Tesla channels on YouTube or EV channels. So you're you're certainly engaged in this space. Mm-hmm. I was at the event too. You were at the event, yeah. obviously. So yeah, yeah. so you got uh some thoughts on it, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll start this with a good transition. Do you think Tim Cook made the right decision here getting out of the robo taxi space now that you've seen other people's kind of entry into it. Uh, probably. I think they probably were f- too far behind and saw the path because the big advantage Tesla has is even though they've been promising this stuff for years um, and they're always late, the big advantage is that they have is data collection. So all the hundreds of thousands of people are using their self-driving technology and Tesla's collecting miles and miles of data on that. And I think they're billions of miles ahead of competitors like Apple. And Apple's probably working with a lot of expensive stuff and LiDAR and they're doing internal testing, but then they're like, wow, the gap here to be able to collect enough stuff is very large and it's just not worth it for us at this point. So I think it makes sense why they backed off on that. And also just making cars profitable is hard. So they probably were like, eh, I don't know. And they probably also saw we're going to have to make this a $100,000 car or more. It's going to be the Apple Vision Pro of cars. Um, yeah, it, it kind of makes sense. Do, does it make sense to you why they backed off? Yeah, it's a crazy thing to get into mm-hmm. at, at, at scale and with their business model. Like, why do it? Why do it? There's no there's no upside. Yeah. There's no upside. Like, they're like, oh, like we spend, we're going to spend billions and billions of dollars and have the lowest profit margin of any of our businesses. You mm-hmm. know? Like, that's yeah. crazy. I did... 
riding a robo taxi recently at Waymo here in Los Angeles. Nice. Uh, very positive experience. Very positive experience. I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. I I think we've all experienced the kind of Uber roulette you play when you get an Uber and you're like, is this driver going to be a crazy person? Mm-hmm. Are they going to uh, talk to me about converting to their giant spaghetti monster religion or whatever it is? Or <laughs> is the car going to be weird? Are they going to be bad drivers? Like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of question marks <laughs> when you get an Uber and this kind of eliminates those because there's no guy there and it's a very standardized experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt incredibly safe. And if anything, maybe I felt overly safe. It definitely was hesitant to make, uh, unprotected left turns. Mm-hmm. Um, it did it. Uh, I maybe I took, it was like less than 10 minutes driving. I, I took one just cause I could, like I didn't really yeah. need to. Um, and I was in downtown LA, which is, uh, I mean, it's slow traffic there. This isn't like on the highways or anything crazy. So it's, it's, mm-hmm. but I will say, you know, there's a lot of unknown things around it that maybe if people aren't used to driving in dense urban environments would be difficult to navigate. People just, you know, blowing the crosswalk and just walking through mm-hmm. uh, delivery trucks, garbage trucks. I mean, there's all kind of crazy stuff that happens when you're driving downtown and it navigated it really well. The app is really cool. It lets you kind of like pick the music that it plays oh, nice. and stuff like that. Yeah. So it was a neat experience. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is cool. The Maybe one of the little bit of downsides from it is that it has to pick what it thinks is safe pickup and drop off points. Mm. So, you know, like you're in an Uber and you're like, dude, I'm gonna just hop out of this light. I'm good. Yeah. And you're like, all right, cool. Like. Way more not happening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, uh, like it has to like, it, you know, it's going to a specific point. To, and then it actually didn't, wouldn't pick me up directly in front of my house. It like was a little bit down where it knew it could get an easy parking space. I imagine in the future, as these things become more popular, they're going to be dedicated autonomous vehicle pickup and drop off points, you know, mm-hmm. built in the cities. Um, kind of like if you're, you know, if you're in big cities now, there's dedicated like EV spots and uh shareable car spots which is something i don't think we've ever talked about here but Mm. you know you can get a subscription to a car and you don't even own the car you can just go to the spot and there's a car you can get in and drive and you drop it off at another designated thing um but i i I believe in robo taxis i think that's Mm -hmm. that's the future uh, for a lot of things um but uh it just seems like when i look at the waymo for example with its huge like Ghostbuster car looking top and all these sensors, yeah. all this stuff they're doing for it. And I look at what Tesla has with the cyber taxi and I'm like, I, I don't know if this thing is going to be a safe man. Like, mm-hmm. like it just seems like, like Tesla kind of abandoning things like LIDAR and all that. I, I just don't know if the technology is there to make it good enough for widespread adoption yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm using the full self-driving supervised right now, which is what they currently ship to anyone who wants it. Um, and I use it in a Model 3, and there's definite still stuff that you can tell it would not do perfectly. But I'm almost to the point where I think it could handle like a geofenced area, like a Waymo does, and mm-hmm. do it well. Because I've been doing long drive, like hour and a half drives down to Orange County in traffic, mm-hmm. and it's getting into the carpool lane, and it's getting doing absolutely yeah. everything the whole way. I'll do it from home let it do all the turns. And honestly, my biggest things that I've had to take over for are it stopping too politely and the car behind me looks like they're going to rear end me because mm-hmm. they're used to California drivers just barreling through stuff. Yeah. Um, or there was like an accident on the freeway that it was like, I didn't want to see what it was going to do like mm-hmm. last minute and be mm-hmm. that guy that's like, oh, sorry, sorry, officer. Yeah, and then yeah. have to, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I waited until the absolute last second to get around <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, I should take you know, this, yeah. Uh, stuff like that. But it, you know, it's not perfect and it's still supervised. Uh, but it has been getting a lot better recently. So I, I have I've grown my confidence in oh, thinking cool. that it would get there. And this changed for me. Like maybe two years ago, I would tell people, don't buy this. It's a waste of money. Mm-hmm. They've been promising it for years. Now I'm like, huh. I'm still not going to say they're absolutely going to get there. Uh, but I'm like, they might they might be able to pull it off. It's and, interesting. Yeah, it is. And, it, you know, talking about the AI kind of integration into it and things like that, like... It, Every si- I've lived a lot of places, you know. I was I grew up very far from here in Louisiana, and mm-hmm. then in between there, I don't I don't I can't even count. I don't know at least a dozen places between the military and traveling and just living places because I want to live there. So I live in a lot of places, and I would say like each city and place has its own personality for driving. Mm-hmm. You know, L.A. very famous for the left on red turn. 
Yeah. Right? Like you can't you can't get anywhere in LA unless you turn left on red, which is essentially means you pull out into the intersection while it's green to make your left turn. The light's going to turn yellow. Uh, opposing traffic's going to stop and then all traffic waits for maybe two or three cars to make the left turn on the red signal. Yeah. This is crazy. It is. Obviously, we should have arrows. More arrows here. We should have, <laughs> but that it's just that's how LA is built. And everyone accepts that here. Mm-hmm. Like if you're in the oncoming traffic or you're waiting, you just know, oh, I gotta I gotta wait for a couple cars to go on the red before I get to go on my green. This is insane. But that's the kind of thing, like, you know, even my short experience with Waymo wouldn't have in that. Like it would not do that, yeah. right? It would not do that at all. So how do you make these AIs drive more naturally? Or even mm-hmm. like you're talking about like almost getting rear-ended or something because you're not stopping in a way that people are used to for the driving personality of that location. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's an interesting thing because a lot of that is interaction between humans and AI. Like if you picture a future where it's all robo-taxis, no robo-taxi is going to care that you're driving politely yeah. and it should be safer yeah. and, every, and all these different things. But today it has to interact yeah. and be safe enough and the, it's it's a weird thing. The four-way stop problem, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like a four-way stop requires human communication to not get annihilated, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like it requires a little bit of like, Oh, well, we got here kind of at the same time, but you inched further out. You look like you're in a hurry. I'm probably like, and you kind of make the eye and you give the wave or something, right? Mm -hmm. It it requires a lot of like, yeah, human interaction that an AI is just not set up to do. And you see this in a lot of like AI tests, like self, you know, autonomous vehicle tests. Like it'll do a lot of like stutter stopping because like that car will start to go and it'll start to go and go, oh, no, no, I need to stop. Now I don't know what to do. Uh, I've seen it where it'll freak out. Uh, this is more of like a San Francisco thing or places with a uh, bike messaging. You know, New York has that a lot too. Is that, you know, if you're, you see guys on bike messaging, bikes will either act like they're pedestrians or act like they're cars and interchange between what laws are following <laughs> based mm-hmm. on what they want to do. And you'll see a lot like a guy like at the corner on the bike and he's kind of like rocking it back and forth. And the self-driving cars are just like, what the hell is this guy doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And the human goes, oh, he's just chilling because he's waiting for this crosswalk light because he's going to cross this crosswalk. But the car goes, oh, well, if he's acting like a car, is he trying to cut me off? And I don't mm-hmm. know what's happening. So uh, I, we got a little ways to go on this, mm-hmm. but I think it's coming. Yeah. And it was very cool at the event. It's obviously, it was at Warner Brothers Studios. Very geofenced. They had sure. pre-mapped it to make yeah, sure this went perfectly. They shot it at a movie studio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it makes sense why they would, they need this to go flawlessly. They apparently, I think they gave, they said over 2,000 people rode in the robo taxis because mm-hmm. they had like 20 prototypes. So they gave tons of rides. And then um, it was, it was very cool. I mean, it was crazy. It was just watching, cause in there, in a Waymo, you still have a steering wheel, so mm-hmm. you can look at what it's doing. And mm-hmm. this, it, no steering wheel, no pedals, just a screen. So you're just in this car that's moving. It, it really felt like a ride at like an amusement park. And then it's absolutely what this event was, which is, this is our vision of the future. And I understand if you take that as them saying, we're delivering this to, like tomorrow. I think he did say before 2027, as does it does me spiking the lens with my <laughs> look of doubt? Uh, yeah. So in Elon time, twenty thirty five, maybe. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Who knows what the real timeline will be? But it was cool nonetheless to experience that future and see that they are going full in on this and they want to achieve that. And if achieved, it would be pretty remarkable and change the world. So that's that's my position on it. And uh, it makes sense why Apple kind of uh, gave up on these endeavors. Changing the world with robo-taxis and Apple Vision.